these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. All right, Kyle is uh, vacationing in Hawaii here. So much like the Timberwolves, Jim Peterson, we're going to put up a fight shorthanded here. The Nuggets better watch out for us right now. That's all I have to say. Well, we've got at least we got a little size in the lineup right now, too. So, you know, <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> I've got Muggsy Bogue size, if that's the, the type of size you well, want. That's okay. We got Ross who can like pinch it. He can step in here once in a while, too. He gives us some like mid range jump shooting ability. Hey, yeah. Ross is like our TJ Warren. He can kind of come in a little, little mid range game, you know, right. box somebody yeah. out. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we were just we were talking before we cracked the microphones. I went to one college basketball game this year. It was the Gophers' ugly loss against Indiana. Have you been to a college basketball game this year? Oh, yeah, I went to I went to a couple uh, okay. Gopher games. I did go to the Northwestern game. Actually, I think that might have been the only Gopher game I made it to. Um, it's not because I don't want to, because I love Ben Johnson and uh, – Dave Thorson are two of the Great greatest job. guys ever. Um, I want to support them, and I do support them. It's just that, you know, the schedule doesn't allow it, really. And then it's really two things. I love go for basketball, but I'm not really a fan of college sports. I don't know yeah. if this I don't know if this is a, a, a very, like, unpopular take, but I just don't enjoy college football. I don't, in college, I don't enjoy college basketball at all. I think in some ways I enjoy I've enjoyed some of the women's games. I probably watched as much women's basketball this year as I've watched uh, men's college basketball. So yeah. uh, I don't know if I'm alone in. I think that might be a lot of people's sentiment. I right think now. most I've seen a lot we, of women Clark games this year. I mean, and despite because I'm kind of with you, like it's it's hard too because you don't recognize as many of the rosters in the '90s. I sound like an old curmudgeon now. The '90s and 2000s. Guys were staying longer, three, four years. You saw the same players on different teams. So it's hard. But none of this is going to stop us from still getting pissed when our teams get bounced out of this bracket that we both have an eye. So you're like one game in and you already have BYU. You're ripping up your bracket. It's bad news. Well, no, I I, I was going to tell you, um, uh, full honesty, um, I, I um, you know, I'm in a family pool on my wife's side. And they take it pretty seriously. We do this thing on CBS Sports. You can, you can sort of get a, a group together, and you can have a whole group that's competing for a championship too. So you're in your own bracket with your family or friends, whatever. And I was under the gun. I didn't hadn't filled out a bracket, so I just did the Wally Zerbiak like fill in, like auto fill pick. And Wally picked uh, BYU over Duquesne, so my bracket's already busted. Way to go, Wally. Wow. Wally, man, <laughs> that loser, Wally Zerbiak. Yeah. So, Wally, um, I'm going to let you hear about it, bro. I mean, By seriously. the way, dude, Dan, speaking of gopher basketball, so Richard Richard Patino and New Mexico, they won the Mountain West tournament, and they're the they're an 11 seed. They play later. 15 seed Long Beach State, Dan, Dan Munson, Munson, is it was like a two-point game at halftime against Arizona, and he's, he's feeling – because they let him go on Monday and last Monday and said, if you want to coach the conference tournament, you can. And then we'll say goodbye and you can pack your office. They win the conference tournament and he's like, you know, he's Seinfelding it now throughout the NCAA tournament. So I'm wishing Dan Munson the best here in this 15 versus two game. Can I tell you, can I tell you a funny story about Dan Munson? Um, two things. Uh, Dan is a great guy mm -hmm. and, his, and his dad was a great coach at Gonzaga. Um, but Dan, when he was at Minnesota, he did one of the best outreaches to alumni that I'd been a part of. He was asking former players to come sit on the bench, which wow. I hadn't had any of that happen to me before or since. No, no coach has ever asked me to come sit on the bench <clears throat> as a honorary coach, you know. And so the night that I did it was when the Gophers were playing Oregon. This is probably, I don't know. 2000 um and so they were playing oregon that night blair rasmussen was uh was playing for oregon that wow. night um and um anyway uh michael thompson was with me so michael had come back to do tv i jumped back to radio with chad and michael thompson and i were going to williams arena for the first time since michael had played michael had not been back to williams arena since 1978 wow gonna be the first time that michael had been back inside williams arena that's amazing. So, so we go, uh, we, so Dan asked both Michael and I to sit on the bench 
And so we're sitting on the bench and at halftime, we were asked to come down into the coaches uh, locker room and be inside the coaches meeting. So, you know, I'm doing radio with Chad and Michael's doing TV with Hanny and we're supposed to be two flies on the wall, right? Well, we get down into the coaches locker room when they all start meeting, Michael starts going, well, you know, I think you need to get out of the zone. I think you need to like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was elbowing Michael. Dan, give me, give me the, give me the pen, give me the pen. Yeah, <laughs> I was elbowing Michael, man. I was elbowing Michael. So, Michael, what are you doing? Like, just relax. I mean, like, it's so weird. it was really funny. Dan laughed it off. He's a good sport about it. Um, the other one was uh, later on when he was things were kind of unraveling for him, and he and I were uh, actually very friendly, and I, I really liked him a lot, and um, he was getting roasted by. Sid Hartman and all these people were, you know, like the end was near for him. Yeah. Right? When and, Sid, uh, when Sid turns on you, yeah, it's over. Yeah. And so I, um, I was sitting like literally in those first row seats right behind the bench. Um, and so I'm sitting there with my wife and, um, Dan looks down and he goes, Oh, it's nice to see a friendly face. <laughs> <laughs> sweating bullets. Oh man. I tell you what, man, coaching is a hard job. And <laughs> but I was, he, he so walked into such a because he, you know, he he so he bring Gonzaga had been competitive but had not really made a run until the ninety nine run that he went on to the elite eight if I remember right and then the Gophers come calling but that was such a hard spot for him and we will talk Timberwolves by the way audience don't worry we've got a lot of Anthony Edwards stuff we will get there but he took over a sanctioned program so it's like hey. Now, of course, now Gonzaga with Mark and Mark Few was an assistant under Dan Munson right. for those right. years, and they were assistants together throughout the '90s. But how do you say no to a Big Ten job of that magnitude? Obviously, if he would have maybe known how it played out, maybe he stays at Gonzaga. But life changing money and yeah. it, tough situation for him, man. Yeah. Um, well, I'm happy for both. Richard Pitino was a, was a character, you know. Um, you know, Dan Munson's great. Um, pulling for both of them but i'm more pulling for ben johnson because i love him i think yeah. he's great and he's in a tough situation all all these coaches are now with nil and the transfer portal but um i i think if anybody can get it done it's going to be ben and it's going to be thors yep yep what a turnaround man i mean it was from from a year ago where uh, is, is 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 ben who are they going to replace ben with was the conversation a year ago and now it's like you know, maybe this gets spoiled by the time people listen to this, but I hope they win the NIT. Let's hang an NIT an NIT banner and get some momentum. Love uh, it. The barn. So, okay, on the Wolves front, I hate being the moral victory guy, but Jim Pete, two different times this season, a Timberwolves loss has elevated my opinion of the team. The first one was the Boston game, the back to back where they wind up because of, was it weather or travel logistics? You guys, you're flying into Boston the day of the game, shorthanded against the best team in the NBA, up by like nine points with three minutes to go. Just show, could, could have totally mailed it in. Conley, I think I think Conley might have been out that game. I can't remember exactly, but just a, a schedule loss. And they fight for 48 minutes and then overtime and you wind up losing. Wow, this team shows fight. That game the other night against Denver was the same thing for me. You're missing three-star big men. It's a back-to-back. -back. You're traveling. Nobody would have really faulted you for just losing by 18 points. And instead, you have a three-pointer with a chance to win the game. I don't know. I come away thinking I'm much more impressed than I was two days ago. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, uh, they had the Boston game. Uh, we played. We beat Orlando. Um, it was a very workmanlike uh, uh, game in Orlando. Um, Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert and Nas Reed all played fantastic in that game. Um, and it was, it was going to be difficult because the, the flight from Orlando to Boston is, I mean, five, whatever it is, five hour, four, hour, five hours, four hours, whatever. Um, um, actually it ended up turning out shorter than I thought because they really put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> there was weather on the, on the coast, the entire That's eastern right. seaboard was, um, was just it was storm central and uh what they thought was best for us to fly the next day which is what we used to do in the nba by the way we flew on we'd play four games in five nights when i played in the nba and you know so obviously you're flying on the day of the game twice for back-to-backs mm -hmm. and we flew commercial so we had to go like super early and sit at the gate with you and ross and all the other 
normies idiots you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but it was it was great but it's like you know to me like i almost felt like one of the reasons why they competed as they did in boston was because we did do that because you had more of a normal schedule um you know you were you were back at the hotel um we knew we were going to do it from the arena we didn't like go to the airport and then turn around we knew from the air from the arena that we were going to back to the hotel and then guys just kind of, I think they got rest, you know, I think they, they got regular rest. We, we left it like whatever, nine in the morning. So it wasn't super early. We got, we got into Boston, like at, at 12 31 o'clock, 12 30. Um, you got time to get some rest and they played well. And Rudy and Mike didn't play in that game, by the way, right. Not only did, Rudy didn't play either. So they, they went back to Minneapolis. Um, yeah. And so there was, there, yeah, there's, so there's no Rudy Gobert, but, yeah, that Boston game was one of one of the more memorable ones because they they easily could have won that game. It was when they were having all those fourth quarter problems, you know, mm -hmm. executing uh, end of game and stuff. So the Wolves are just one and four in overtime too. So they have not had a lot of overtime success. Um, and some of those overtime games, well, we just had one in Cleveland. I mean, that game was stolen from us by the referees. I think it was a it was a case. Um, and I'm still upset about. The, the elbow that Jokic did to Monte Morris, um, el he did a post with crab dribble drop step and he like elbows um, Monte Morris in the jaw. It was the same play that, that Rudy Gobert was called in Cleveland in the fourth quarter. I don't know if you remember that Rudy had a yeah. drop step against uh, Jared Allen that, you know, hit him in the chest. But so like Rudy's was in the chest and they called it a flagrant foul. And it, you know, it, it didn't change the game because, you know, Jared Allen did go one of two and they did miss the shot when they got the ball back. But um, anyway, it, it's, it's, it's not been good, but the Denver game, the way they fought. Um, and this is what I say, Phil, I say, um, and I've said this on the broadcast a couple of times that sometimes a necessity is the mother of invention. And so having the three bigs out allows Chris Finch to try things that he wouldn't normally do putting Kyle at the five. And in that Denver game, they really scrambled the, the way that they were able to get into rotation is something you can only do when you have a smaller lineup and the way that they were able to cover and then have elite level defenders like Jaden, like Nikhil, like Ant, J Mac, when he was in there, Monte's very good. Mm -hmm. Mike is smart. Kyle is just so high level in terms of his anticipation and reading of the situation. They did something in that game that was very interesting and they did it on the first possession. They doubled Jokic. Yeah. Uh, that's something that you don't want to have to do. If you when you play against Denver, if you start doubling Jokic, now you're getting into rotation. Not everybody can do that, but they doubled Jokic probably 10 or 11 times in that game. And they rotated the, the heck out of it. Even if they scored, they still covered. You know what I mean? Like it was just very impressive. And they probably had four or five of the most in, incredible uh, defensive possessions of, of doubling, rotating, covering, getting stops. And that's how they got back in the game in that third quarter and why it was close at the end. Yeah. They also, in, in the first half, I counted four or five missed layups or just like little, even uncontested sort of restricted area shots that, that the Wolves missed that would have made the game different. I think if you give... If you give Luca Garza eight of the same looks from three, I mean, he had some wide open looks too. That and he's and and by the way, it's going to be Nas Reed that's taking those threes or Cat that's taking those threes in a playoff series. You know, the, the, put it this way: I don't have the box score in front of me, but just remembering it from the other night, the Nuggets shot fifty-two percent from the field, fifty-two percent from three. The Wolves were missing three all-caliber big men. And the Nuggets had a rebounding advantage of like 12 or 13 extra rebounds over the Wolves. It was 12, yeah, it was 49 12. 37. Yeah. And they almost lost. I mean, if you're the Nuggets, I, maybe I'm just being an overreactive homer here, but the way the Wolves played the Nuggets in the five tough games in the playoffs last year without Jaden, without Nas, the way they played them a couple nights ago, I don't know. If I'm the Nuggets, I hope the Wolves get – I hope the Nuggets – if I'm the Nuggets, we'll take the one seed. Wolves, you have the two seed, so we don't have to deal with you until the Western Conference Finals. I would not want that smoke if I'm the Nuggets. Well, I just think that, uh, again, you know, Chris Finch was able to 
uh, has been able to do some things now the last couple of games of being able to kind of try stuff. And so I think that the fact that they can play small like they did with, with Kyle at the five and the way that they can fly around and rotate and their rotations were a thing of beauty. Like just going back and watching the video again, uh, I'm going to attempt to, you know, get some of those clips. Sometimes when you show defensive clips in a pregame show, you know, you have a package of them. Sometimes these packages can get kind of long, and you know, TV is Phil. You like, you, like you don't want to have these big long packages. But I bring love- them, bring them, bring them to us. We'll do, we'll do, <laughs> let's do an extra YouTube breakdown. I think some the audience needs to see the long form. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, it's just you know, when you're when you're watching these clips, and you know, you want to stop and start them and rewind them, and like, like, and and just kind of really look at the technique that's done and the decision making that's being done in real time by these really high level players. Um, and then the coaching staff to be able to put the game plan together and also to make adjustments because the Wolves didn't play the, the same way in, in the second half that they played in the first half. Yeah, uh, They gave up 70 points in the first half. Um, and they, so that's when you start making adjustments and you start demanding that players do stuff. And this is where I say like Chris Finch has been so great um, in, in, in the coaching staff as well, the way they're able to communicate with players and get them to do stuff. Cause it's just high level stuff. And it was just really fun to watch them compete the way they did on a national stage. Cause it was on NBA TV. It was a lot of, a lot of people were watching that basketball game and they wanted to see that, that, you know, Minnesota Denver matchup. And I just think that if I'm Denver, I'm a little bit afraid just because, you know, of what you just said about how we almost took them down with a depleted roster. You bring towns, Gobert and Nas Reed back. And we've got multiple ways that we can play. Yeah. By the way, I've, I I was telling Judd this the other day on our other podcast, or it might have been. We actually think it was on Flagrant Howls. We did a we did a day after show, and uh, I have two major regrets in terms of leaving sporting events early in my life. One was a 2009 Twins game, a 2009 Twins game where Jason Kubel they were they were playing the Angels. They were down a bunch of runs. It was kind of a nondescript regular season game. And I left early. I can't remember why. And Jason Kubel hits for the cycle with the final hit being a go-ahead grand slam in like the bottom of the eighth inning. Dick Bramer just losing his mind as I'm watching on TV at home. The other one was the Kevin Love 30 and 30 game against the Knicks from like 2011. Wow. And they and that was a bad team. They had maybe 14 wins all year or something. And it was halftime. They were down by eight points, whatever it was. I think Love had maybe 10 points, eight rebounds. And I was going to every game and just, I just wanted to go home. I I was tired, had to work next day. I went to the first half of the Denver game, Jim Pete, sat sat behind our guys, Johnny K and Dane Moore up in the the media section. And I had it planned. My wife was going out of town and I just, I had some stuff to get done. I'm going to watch the first half. And we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm probably going to leave at halftime. They are down by like 13 points. Their top three big men aren't playing. I left the game at halftime. <laughs> and I got home. And you and Grady are, you know, they're, oh, it's, that, they cut it to three. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm watching at home trying to figure out, yeah. do I want them to win? Am I going to have to put this on my Mount Rushmore? Of, I guess I'm learning my lesson. Never leave a sporting event early. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you know, you got things to do, man. Your wife is getting ready to go out of town. You're being, you're being loyal. To Trying to be wife. a good husband, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't, you know, I don't really think I have, I have to think about that. If I've done that before where I've left a sporting event early and then it turned around. Um, I don't know. I've stayed, I've stayed. I probably would have left the Vikings game when they played the Colts. Judd did. We, t- we summoned, we actually, we summoned Judd because we do a, a post game show on Purple Daily YouTube channel. Vikings vent line and we are texting we said the audience wants us to start the vent line in the third quarter because they're so mad so Judd why don't you leave the game go into the studio and it, it wound up being even better because here's you can just see the regret on Judd's face as the game winning field goal goes through and he's, he's mouthing to himself oh my god I left <laughs> I left the greatest comeback well the greatest thing is that you know Michael Grady's an Indianapolis kid you know and he's uh you know he's been to a million Colts game because he worked in the media um, in Indianapolis and he had to sit there and watch that whole thing. 
<laughs> just, <laughs> oh, come back. Torturous, man. Oh, man. He, he's, he, was, he was a great sport about it, though. But it was like that's one of the great sporting events I ever just stuck around for. I watched that game at home, and I did not turn it off. I stayed with it the whole time. Yeah. And I, you know, I, and the um, the other one was um, I had a hundred dollar bet with Dave Benz, um, and I forget what Super Bowl was the New England Patriots Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl when yep. the game was over, and Benz didn't show up. I had a Super Bowl party at my house, and Benz didn't even show up for the first half when I could just I just ground it into him, you know, because the Patriots just killing Atlanta. He shows up for the second half when Atlanta starts coming, you know, or, or the me, other way around. Yeah. Other, it was the other way around. I, I had Atlanta. He had, he had the Patriots and it's when the, the Patriots kind of, and Ben was like doing this annoying clap in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I was so annoying. I wanted to punch him in the face so bad. I had to give him a hundred bucks to really, really chat my hide. Man. But, uh, no, it was, it was great though. It was great. I, I just wish they could have pulled it. I wish Ant would have hit that three at the end and Minnesota could have won an overtime. Uh, it, the only overtime game they've won all season long is at home against Boston, the other great Boston game. Yeah, man, so. there, there's been actually on the on the Anthony Edwards front. So, I think my favorite thing about that performance was when you go into a game and you're already depleted offensively, even like at at full strength. They have two main offensive options. Nas Reed is is in the mix, so your other offensive options are gone. And you look around the starting lineup, and it's it's a bunch of defensive guys. It's Kyle Anderson, Jade McDaniels, and then you know that Luca Garz is going to play 20 minutes. And I would think the temptation for a lot of players of Ant's caliber is to go 2005 Kobe Bryant and shoot the ball 39 times and just say, well, this is the night where I'm just going to sling it 39, 40 times, and we'll see what happens. And he resisted that urge to get open looks for everybody else, to get open looks for Nikhil open looks for Luca Garza even. And I think just getting the ball moving around, I don't know, maybe you disagree on this, but I thought it showed a level of maturity and basketball sense by Anthony Edwards to not just bulldoze his way for 40 shot attempts on a night where I think he probably could have. Well, that's one of the things that Grady and I have marveled at. Um, even when he had 44 against Indiana, he had 35 shots that night. Um, it didn't seem like he had forced anything. Um, and through this time without Towns, um, I think Ant's done a really mar- remarkable job of getting his teammates involved and still carrying a heavy load. Like he's still averaging 30 plus points a game in this stretch of games. But um, um, I think that there are times when he does um, overcook, you know, like yeah. he, when, when he gets cooking and, and, and we've all seen Ant go on those, on those boomlets, those, those runs that he can go on. Um, and sometimes he can overdo it. And I think he overdid it a little bit um, in this game where he um, took the wind out of the offensive sales a little bit. But I think that um, Dane Moore had a really great tweet. You know, these guys go in the locker room after the game and they do a great job interviewing these players and, and they get really – and Dane particularly, just because he's so insightful, mm-hmm. um, Dane does a great job of um, getting to the heart of the matter – and I think he talked to Mike Connolly about that very topic and um, Ant realized when it was happening. So like now, now he, you know, before he didn't realize, but now he realizes, and I think he was trying to do something about it. And, and Mike just gave Ant a lot of credit for coming to the conclusion himself. So there, I mean, he's 22 years old, man, and he's, he's learning so much. And he's um, that last, this last road trip, um, I, I tweeted this out. Like I, I will never forget this last road trip and it's all because of Ant and the way that he played, even though the Wolves lost two games, uh, the Cleveland game was kind of taken from him. As I said, the Laker game was just about the size disparity that they had, but the block in Indiana, the game winning play and the, the two games in, in, uh, in Utah and then the comeback in, in, in Los Angeles against the Clippers I mean, Anthony Edwards is just next level. And those performances in Utah might have been two of the grittiest performances. And I think that all those – Kyle Anderson deserves a lot of credit. Mike Conley deserves – I mean, all those guys just gutted it out. And uh, just w- one of the most memorable road trips of my 26 years. With yeah. The you saw the – you saw the on the bookends the block of the year in the NBA and the and the dunk of the year at the end of the road trip. Yeah. Same road trip. It's crazy. 
I mean, yeah, and then but but the comeback too, um Grady and I were talking about we didn't do the Clipper game because it was on TNT, of course. Um, but there were a bunch of defensive sequences where Anthony Edwards uh, just made incredible plays. Well, they all did, but like there was a play in particular that Michael and I were marveling at where Ant got a steal on Paul George, Minnesota gets the possession and he goes down and just attacks the basket. And it was one of those demoralizing plays that turns the tide in the game. Yeah. And the body language of Paul George, you know, after that play was just, it was just so satisfying, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so like, I don't know. You could go back and like it wasn't just those two plays. There were so many plays. I mean, there was there was one three that um, that Ant hit in that second game in Utah um, that was just such a key shot. Like he just came down and canned it, and he, he's standing right by Finch. He turns around, he goes back to run to the defensive end. He, he slaps a high five. It was kind of a side five. It wasn't like a high five. It was like a side five with Finchy on the sideline. Uh, I'll just never forget stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff that just makes memories. And the 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 legend of Anthony Edwards is just just growing. And it's must see TV, right? Yeah. There's a certain I don't know. I, maybe I'm just romanticizing basketball and the KG era, but I feel like being able to be the conductor of the arena, in a sense, is the sign of a true superstar in the NBA. I mean, there's certain guys like Tim Duncan didn't have that personality and you can still do it with, with being more subdued, but there's just something about you're trying to get 15, 18,000 people. If you're playing a home game to bring the energy with you. And I just think all those times where KG would make a great defensive play, grab a rebound out, like, like get something going, thump in his chest, standing on the scores table. Anthony Edwards has that ability to just wrap 18,000 people around his finger inside target center or the other way around on the road and just take the life out of an opposing crowd in a way that not many guys have in the NBA. And I don't know like how to quantify that, but I feel like that energy that he creates matters in the NBA. Yeah. You know, um, there's a famous photograph. I, don't, I, don't, I think you can Google it. I haven't Googled it for a while. Um, but there's a, the famous picture of KG, like, like the Messiah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like he's, he's down at one end and he's like, like has his arms up, like he's the Messiah. Um, and, and I just remember like when he would do that, um, they come out and they play whatever, welcome to the jungle. It's like, it's like post it's coming out of a timeout after the other team called a timeout to stop a tide, uh, to stem a tide or whatever. And, or break a run and KG came and he would get the crowd up and he would do that. And would just like send him into a frenzy, mm -hmm. you know, and aunt, aunt did that um, in that last game at home. Like he made a shot and he was like going down, you know, he was like exhorting the crowd, you know, as he was going circling back to the bench. Um, it's just special when you have an athlete like that. And target center has been the place to be all season long. Um, and it's, it's going to continue to be that way. And I feel so lucky to be able to do what I do and to do it with great people and to be with Grady and Grady is even taking it to another level too. Like Grady, Grady's ability to like be dramatic, to be like, you know, he's, he's, he's always so measured and like his, his, the quality of his voice is just so it's so next level, but then his knowledge of the game and his sense of dramatic, um, moments. He's just like Ant, you know. So it's like a, it's like a, it's like a perfect pairing, you know, to be yeah. a part of all this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and hopefully I'm adding my part of it too. You know, like I'm just trying to bring the, you know, 26 years of experience and whatever um, in, inside I add. But like it's just like it's just the whole thing is just so great. Rudy, Mike, Jaden. I mean, like the whole Kyle, like this, it's just perfect. I don't want it to end almost, you know, I want it to keep going and I want our fans to be able to enjoy all this. Yeah, no. And yeah, you're being modest, but you are, you, and you've been through a lot of dark wolf seasons and yeah. you guys are a great pairing, man. It is. I know, you know, I think, was it, did you tweet something or were we texting? I mean, you've, you've compared Grady to some of the, the best NBA play by play guys in the country and, and it is possible that at some point, much like Kevin Harlan 25 years ago, that he goes on to bigger, better things. But um, it he has added such a great flavor to this resurgent franchise 
And um, it's been a blast yeah, to watch him grow and to watch, you know, you guys grow together and Anthony Edwards at the same time. It has the same vibes as kind of the, the mid to late nineties and the first time this franchise rose to prominence. Yeah. Well, no, I, so like when, when Ant, um, oh, I just, I was going to tell you this too, as an aside, um, when, so when Ant did the dunk and when he, you know, he completely like started looking at his left hand, he was looking at his left hand. Um, I was tweeting out why I didn't react that much. Cause I was like, it was the greatest play I've ever seen from Ant, but other than the dunk, but like him grabbing his hand and, you know, we're kind of trained not to speculate on injuries. The team doesn't want you to speculate injuries. Um, the players management team and, and agent, they don't want you speculating about injuries. So I'm trying to think of what to say that's going to not speculate about the injury. I kind of feel like I knew what happened, but I wasn't hundred percent sure I didn't, but I'm thinking this could be the greatest play in the, in the most tragic play of the season. Um, because if Ant had broken his finger, um, then he would be out probably, you know, yeah. I mean, like um, he, he, he probably, so I, I just chose to let the pictures do the talking. Cause I think that in sports, sometimes people talk too much. And I think that it's better to lay out and let and let and so and Grady has the same sensibility too, by the way, because Grady doesn't over talk either. Um, if you go back and watch that whole sequence, we didn't say a lot. Like he, his initial call was awesome, yeah. right? The way that he went, the way that he called it. But um, I just I just was so upset about like Ant, Ant could be really super hurt. So. So anyway, so I I um I got a story about this after the fact. So Ant goes back to the locker room, and uh, David Hines, who's one of our trainers, does a, just a great job. This training staff is so good; they're so cool to travel with, and how attentive they are to everything. But David Hines goes back there, and he eases Ant's finger back into the socket. He had dislocated his finger, and so David Hines eases it back, and he's got to go back out and shoot the free throw, or else he can't. Yeah into the game yeah and so like they're doing all this like you know you're what is it broken so like trainers just know because i mean if you look at any nba players like you've ever seen larry bird's hands how gnarled, how gnarled up they are like yeah it's like you're <laughs> you, you you just like you dislocate fingers all the time you know whether you're you know jamming it into the forehead of a player that you're dunking on or whether you, you get the, the basketball dislocate your finger or whatever yeah. happens get it caught in a jersey um, he had to ease it back in, tape it up, and had to come back out and shoot a free throw. So I don't know. It just it it end it ended well, but in that moment, it's just you're always sort of like, what's the best way to handle this situation? Um, I had actually had two fingers dislocated. I was playing one on one with Shrunas Marshallonis back when I was playing for the Golden State Warriors, and Shrunas was so strong, like he. He's one of the strongest human beings I've ever been around. And so I'm playing one-on-one -on -one against him before the, before the game. We're in our, you know, game uniforms or whatever. And I'm playing one-on-one, -on -one and I slapped down. I was going to strip the ball from him as he was going up. And I I got all ball, and I hit it as hard as I could. And, and Rooney just powered up right through me and laid it up. And I my hand started hurting. I looked down at my fingers, and both of, both of my fingers were bent backwards. Oh, they were like literally bent, you know, bent <laughs> like at the middle knuckle. The the middle knuckle, both of them, my index finger and my middle finger, <laughs> oh, no. were were bent backwards. <laughs> and it, it just was so surreal looking. I'm looking at my hand. I'm going like, ah, uh, this is not good. Oh. So I just I just ran back to the locker room and I and went to the trainer and and uh, Tom Abdenauer just takes my finger and he just he just eased it back into the joint. Oh, and I taped him up and. Shooting hand or, or non-shooting shooting hand? hand? Shooting hand, shooting hand. So that's I the thing about shoot, Ant. I like didn't a, I didn't shoot a lot in those days, Phil. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that's like at least for for Ant, and he had against the Nuggets, he had I think his two middle fingers points. were they were taped points. They were taped together like a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> <And> he, <laughs> that's probably why he didn't shoot forty times. Actually, now that I think about it, <laughs> yeah, it's a, just a great memory, though. I mean, this is just more more of Anthony Edwards and his legend. You know, it's just unbelievable. It's a blast, man. Yeah, yeah. it's um, it's so much fun to watch. We're getting closer to the playoffs here, and I think maybe next week when Kyle's back too, we should we should carve out some time. the The Eastern Conference is going to have like a thirty five win Hawks team is going to be in the plan. 
the Western Conference right now, Jim Pete, the play the, the if the playoffs started today or the play in started today, the four play in teams would be the Mavericks, Suns, Lakers, and Warriors. I mean, you literally have yeah. Hall of Famers up and down, some of the greatest players of all time fighting to play Thunder Nuggets or Timberwolves in that first round. It the West is gonna be pretty wild in about a oh. month. Don't forget about the Houston Rockets, too, because they've uh, – MAU Doka's got them rolling. They've won six in a row, and they've won eight of eight of ten. So yep, um, they're looking like they're pretty formidable. We're going to see them before the season's over, too. We play them towards the end of the season here. So um, it's going to be one of the ten home games that the Wolves have um, on this stretch. So yes. Yep, so but, so don't don't cross that one off as an automatic win, yeah, no, I guess. So. Not too uh, before we say goodbye to Jim Pete, I just want to shout out our friends at First Equity Mortgage, too. So David at First Equity Mortgage is a 20-year season ticket holder of Wolves and Lynx. You, you see him roaming around. A few years ago, I had a great experience refinancing my home at the time with First Equity Mortgage. And I did some counting. 20 of my friends and coworkers have had great experiences with First Equity as well. 24 years in the market. They're local. They work fast. They have a great reputation in the community you know you're getting a great experience and a Timberwolves fan when you work with David at First Equity. FEMort.com. That's FEMort.com or go to scorenorth.com, keyword David. So I've been trying to look over and see if there's any other crazy things happening here. It looks like our uh, our uh, Long Beach State miracle with Dan Munson appears to have <laughs> stalled out in the second half here. So we'll see what happens, Jim. <laughs> Magic's over. I'm a, little dis- I'm a little disappointed that Ross never popped in. He said he was going to pop in and join us. But Ross, what are you doing back there? I was utterly repulsed at the finger story and couldn't, <laughs> couldn't find it. <laughs> couldn't find a chance to hop back. And now you guys, as as the kids say, you guys were cooking pretty good without me. I did get a chuckle when you talked about people knowing not to talk too much. And I thought to myself, boy, I don't know anybody like that who talks too much. That's a hint. That's a hint yeah. to Ross to not jump in, I guess. <laughs> who could who could that be? Hey, Jim, can I ask you one quick question before you bolt? Sure. Uh, on the Wolves at home court advantage and the vibe at Target Center, I thought watching the game on, my, was it Monday night, that Phil Phil left early too and almost Tuesday. lived to regret it. Was it. Tuesday, it was Tuesday night. Tuesday, Tuesday night, night. yeah. yeah. I mean, the vibe's been great in there all year, but on TV, it was fantastic on Tuesday night. You talk to people around the league. What are other coaching staffs, analysts, players saying about having to play at Target Center? It's not, this isn't your older brother's or even father's Target Center to come into anymore. Is that getting around the league a little bit that it's a bit more of a volatile place to play these days? I know the, the record's slow down a little bit or come back a bit, but some of that's more injury related than anything. Yeah, no, it's, it's become a harder place to play for sure. Um, they, people are talking about it. I do hear um, at the analysts and, and play by play guys, we talk about the energy in the building and stuff. And, um, and even our players have talked about it too, that they notice it. Um, and, and the noise matters. I mean, if you're making all this noise when they're trying to execute, it does. It does. That's why home court advantage matters. But I just think it's interesting. The Wolves have been so good this year. They actually have more road wins than they have home wins right now. Um, they've got 24 road wins and 23 home wins. But obviously that that shows you a little bit of the home road disparity. That's why we're going to get some of this stuff back here towards the end of the season and play more home games. But we've been on the road for a long time. And um, I just don't – there's only a few places that we play in that are as loud as Target Center. Um, one of them is Boston. One of them is Madison Square Garden. I think those two are two of the hardest places to play. I think Boston might be the hardest place to play because um, when they get all revved up, it is really loud in there. But um, I think Target Center has become really, really hard to play. And I just is. It, I mean, when you're in the building, the energy is amazing, right? I mean, it's our ridiculous. Is so great. And I and I say this even when the Wolves weren't that great. I mean, people would come to the games and. This is a this is a basketball state, man. People know the game here, and they're very they're very basketball savvy in this market. So, um, I just think that I've always said if you if you win they'll come, if you win they'll come and they'll be loud, and it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. So I look forward to each and every home game. Love it, great vibes, and um, yeah, just keep it rolling. Yeah. And w- one last thing from me, multiple people, and I'm not joking about this, multiple people in the comments going back a few weeks, 
many requests on YouTube to see, I'm going to blank on the name. Did you call it the, the world's greatest travel bag? <laughs> Pe people want to see it, Jim. So you're going to have to get that okay, in camera uh, frame at some point. I'll, uh, people I'll, I'll pull up. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take a picture of it. And, yeah. Um, and I will, I will um, tag you guys. Text, okay. Yeah, put it text, out on social or, or, or text it over. We'll put it up on the YouTube the world's channel. Greatest bag, man. The world's greatest bag. Yeah, people wanted to see it. It was the it was the talk of the YouTube comments that podcast. Gotcha. Amazing. All right, Jim Pete, good luck with okay. Wally Zerbiax recommended picks, and we'll talk again next. Wally. All right. <laughs> there he is, Jim Peterson here on Flagrant Howls, your favorite Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.